Yes, 1 John is what we're going to be looking at this morning. And we did give you a little introduction last year. You remember 2020. Um, we talked a little bit about who John was, why he wrote, and so on and so forth. One study Bible I read introduced the book of 1 John as follows. Listen to what he wrote. John's gospel explains how Jesus Christ came to offer eternal life. His first letter tells us how to know by our experience and behavior that we have eternal life. John's gospel tells us how Jesus came to reveal the Father. His letter shows us how we can be confident in our relationship with him. John's gospel relates how Jesus gives the spirit to each one who is born again. His letter explains daily life in the spirit. John's gospel encourages Jesus' disciples to practice spiritual unity by loving one another. His letter clarifies how to put that love into action. Let's open our Bibles to 1 John. 1 John, and we'll start in chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to read the rest of chapter 1 and go into a little bit of chapter 2, and then we'll start talking about it. John 1, 1 John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and that truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in it. For all that is in the world, the love of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but of the world and the world is passing away and the lust of it. And he who does the will of God abides forever. And we'll stop there. So we return to first, the first epistle of John. What did John write? Well, he wrote the gospel as we heard. 
Uh, he wrote three epistles or letters. And lastly, he wrote the book of Revelation. What we're going to do is we're going to divide the, uh, the portion today into three parts. First, we'll give you some background briefly, then the text itself, and then some takeaways, things that we can practically apply in our lives based on the scripture, based on what we've studied together. Okay, some background first. Remember John's writing style. Uh, it is different from what we have seen in the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, Paul goes from one point to another in order to build his argument. If A equals B, then B equals C, et cetera, et cetera. It's a linear style. John seems to go from topic to topic, and then he circles back later, giving more detail. The topics just come one right after the other. It's all wonderful. It's all good to hear, but it's very hard to outline. The second thing from background, what you're going to hear are key tests of genuine salvation. John wrote in his book to both show that the false teachers in the church were not saved just by comparing them by these tests. He also used those tests to reassure the Christians that they were genuinely saved. So you're going to hear tests. There's six of them. And it's kind of woven into the text as we go through chapter one. So those two things, keep that in mind. John's writing style, a topic a minute almost, but it's good stuff. Second of all, the key tests of genuine salvation. How do you know you're saved for sure? And that person is saved. Who's your teacher? Okay, let's go into the text itself. First of all, salvation tests one and two. Look at verse five of chapter one. This is the test of belief in God. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The word light refers to biblical truth, while darkness is error or falsehood. Light, truth, darkness, falsehood. Light also refers to holiness and purity, while darkness refers to sin or wrongdoing. So we see in him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the light, biblical truth, and purity and holiness. Jesus is life itself and the source and sustainer of spiritual life. That's important to us. Because once we've accepted Christ as our personal Savior, we are living that spiritual life. John 8, 12 says, John again writing, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I like that. If someone professes to possess the light and to dwell in it, Having received eternal life, he will show evidence, or she will show evidence of spiritual life by his devotion both to truth and righteousness and holiness. Without that evidence, the person is dwelling in darkness. Test number one, are you dwelling in, abiding in the light, the purity, the biblical truth? The second test is in verse eight of chapter one. The test of the certainty of sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. The Lord Jesus taught that every human being is sinful. You, me, and everybody else. The certainty of sin a way to tell if a Christian is genuine is, does he understand that? Sin is deadly, dangerous, and ever-present. There were false professors or false teachers at the time, and they were coming into the church. And as we said last time, that was one of the reasons why John wrote the book. Listen to verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 10, 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word, his word is not in us. There were two groups of false professors. These were the, the predecessors of the Gnostics and they were deceiving the church. These people were not saved. The first group said that, well, yeah, I sinned, but that's not important. How I live my life doesn't matter as long as I'm focusing on the spiritual aspects of life. They were ignoring their sin, claiming their spiritual life was everything. James 1, 23 and 24 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And that's exactly what they did. They lived like the devil, but claimed to be God's people. The second group of false teachers claimed not to have any sin at all. Oh, I don't sin. Not in my life, no sin. Romans 3, 10 to 12 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. But they said they didn't sin. So you have these two groups. Both of them were really making out God to be a liar based on his word. The test of the certainty of sin. Understand that. In this case, you had the false teachers. And they were ignoring their sin or believing they didn't sin. Okay, tests three and four. The first one, look at 1 John chapter 1 again, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, in the New Testament, the word walk speaks of sanctification, our walk in Christ. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, repents, turns to the Lord, he is justified. He becomes a son or daughter of God. The next step is how that person lives the life. The Holy Spirit indwells the person. The person can then live for the Lord by God's grace and help. That's part of sanctification. That person is moving to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now note, the blood of Jesus Christ that's mentioned in verse 7 cleanses us from all sin. Some sin, the big sins, all sin, past, present, and future. The test of a Christian, number three, is the test of belief in the forgiveness of sins. This sin in our lives can be forgiven. When we don't know him, we accept him. When we do know him as a son or daughter, sin is forgiven. Confession is next. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Many of us know that verse by heart. And we know it because we use it. Sin gets in our lives. Psalm 51, 1 and 2. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David speaking. Once you are justified and become a child of the king, as a believer, you must regularly confess your current sins to your loving Heavenly Father. Regularly confess. Jesus said to him in John 13, 10, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, 
but is completely clean and you are clean. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus at Calvary is the basis upon which we confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. We must confess our sin regularly. Why? What did Paul say? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It is our flesh, our humanness, that goes, oh, goody, goody, let's sin. The unredeemed humanness of our flesh is what gets us into sin. We need to confess that sin. But we're doing it to a loving Heavenly Father. The first day we realized we were sinners before a holy God, we feared his wrath and we received Jesus Christ as Savior. Now that we know him, he's our loving Heavenly Father. The prodigal son comes home and says, treat me as one of your hired servants. I'm terrible. I'm awful. Look what I did. And the father says, bring the fatted calf out. We're going to celebrate. He who is dead is now alive. That's the kind of closeness that we have as we confess our sins to our father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse two, uh, chapter two, verse one, the first part of it. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Get this, this is important. The New Testament says we as Christians are no longer slaves to sin and are given the spiritual means to have victory over sin. You died to sin. You're now slaves to God, not to sin. Paul's strong command to believers assumes that resources are available to conquer sin while you still remain in the body. Romans 6, 12 to 14, listen. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey, its, in it, obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So why do we sin? Because we want to. Well, I'm a Christian, so I don't really want to. Yes, you do. The flesh, the humanness brings out more and more. I can cheat a little bit over there. I can lust a little bit over there. It's okay. We even trade on the fact that we can confess our sin. Oh, he'll forgive me. The decision here is deciding not to sin. And that's the key. The Holy Spirit is within you, the spirit of the living God. But you kind of ignore that part. I always got the impression when I sinned in a situation like that as a Christian, I just didn't look up. Silly. But that's the way I felt. I can, I can do it. And we do it today. Deciding not to sin. And look what John says here. Look what the Lord provides. Verse 1 again, the second part. And if anyone sins, he said, do not sin. But the second part of the verse says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is really good. If anyone sins, that phrase implies a strong possibility of it happening. Surprised? Oh, I'm holy all the time. Be real. The word we in that verse, the second part of verse one, includes the apostle and the little children, which is all believers in general, and us. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. Don't sin. But if you mess up and you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. 
but don't keep going down like a bowling pin. The grace is there, the power's there. The problem is we don't use it. Are you ever in such a rush that you don't flip the light switch on as you walk into a room? Your toes will tell you very quickly that you should have turned on the light switch. The power is there. The word translated advocate, this is really good. Of course, in a legal setting, it's one called alongside to help, a defender, a counselor. The word translated advocate in 1 John 2.2 is used of the Holy Spirit in John's gospel, where it is translated helper or comforter. Sound familiar? We have an advocate the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a power, the Holy Spirit himself. What do we get? Verse two, perfect propitiation through Christ. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The word propitiation is satisfaction. Working at Chase years ago, I used to see people coming in and they were paying off their loan. They wanted you to know it. And they wanted a piece of paper that said they paid it off. Why? They wanted satisfaction. And he himself is the satisfaction for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. The Lord Jesus Christ completely turns God's wrath from sinners to himself, thus removing our guilt. Okay, salvation test, yet another one. Yes, there are more, there are two more. Salvation test number five, the test of keeping his commandments. How can you tell a person is a Christian? They keep God's commandments, his word. Now, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments, verse three. The word know means to continually perceive something by experience. You're familiar with doing this. You go and get coffee at the same place every day. You do things in routine. The word is talking about know. This is how we know. We know because we keep his commandments. The word keep stresses the idea of an observant, watchful obedience. Sort of like driving down the highway and you're speeding and then you see a police car. You quickly slow down. You're very observant. Keep stresses the idea of being careful with these commandments to obey them. Don't do this, I won't. Do this, I will. Willing obedience to scripture and daily living is a reliable indicator both to yourself and to others, that you've come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The test of keeping his commandments. John gives us more. Verse 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But, whatever keeps, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. I like John in the way he writes. John tells it like it is. If you're playing games, you're lying. That's what he says. Oh, you could have been a little nicer about, about it. You know, I mean, maybe you're a little off from the truth, but no, you're a liar. And John calls a spade a spade as the expression goes. A liar is if we claim to know him, but do not keep his commandments. You see that guy over there? He's a Christian. Well, is he showing it by his life? What about the deeds he's doing? How is he behaving? Well, you know, not really that much, but I know he's a Christian. Really? He's failing the test. Verse 5 says, our love for God is perfected or accomplished, showing our salvation. God grants us supernatural love for him, which results in obedience to the scriptures. 
The Holy Spirit is within us. God gives us the strength and the desire to love him. We do. You wake up in the morning, oh, the Lord is so good. We love him. Romans 5.5, 5, Paul says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been, get this, poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God has been poured into our hearts. We love him because he first loved us. But that love has been poured out from God through the Holy Spirit to our lives. Again, John continues in verse 6 of chapter 2. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. In his steps, the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do people read the Gospels? I want to see what the Lord did because I want to do what he does. The only person who can pass the test is the one who abides in him. John 15, 4 and 5. John says, abide in me, he's quoting the Lord, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. One more time. Without me, you can do nothing. The only person who can pass this test is the one who abides in him. <laughs> to abide, to abide. It's to remain in him. It's not a temporary superficial attachment. It's a deep connection. You and your girlfriend are dating. Are you getting serious? Yeah, maybe. Over time, maybe you get engaged and then you make a commitment. And in Christian marriage, you have a full commitment. You are abiding with your loved one. John Stott, Christian writer from years ago, writes, being a Christian consists in essence of a personal relationship to God in Christ, knowing him, loving him, abiding in him, as the branch abides in the vine. You don't see that branch kind of saying, I think I'm going out Thursday. I don't really want to be in the vine, but I'll be back. He's, the branch is always there. The Christian will walk in the light that is truth and holiness and obey his commandments in love for the truth and him who is the truth. Now, keep in mind, our obedience won't be perfect. Maybe it is for you, but it's not for me. But we follow Christ's example. The final test, number six, L-O-V-E. John was called the apostle of love. Listen to verse seven of chapter two. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Love is an old commandment. It's been said a lot in the Old Testament. That's where they may have heard it as they read the word of God. But verse eight follows. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The commandment is new and that has never before seen like it was seen in Christ himself. And it's never before seen as it's been in Christians. So in the New Testament, the talk of love is new. The Lord illustrated his love for the disciples in John 14. He told them he would prepare a place for them. I love you. His peace would be with them. I love you. He would send the Holy Spirit to them. I love you. And by abiding in him, they would bear much fruit. I love you. Love, as expressed by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Believers show this love according to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, etc. With the coming of Christ's spiritual kingdom, the true light began shining and overcoming the darkness of Satan's kingdom. You realize you represent the light that's coming. Now, yeah, but it's still pretty dark, yes. But you represent the light. Verses 9 to 11 concludes the thought, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. John now takes the supernatural, supernatural love to those who claim to be a Christian. This is where the rubber meets the road, as the expression goes. See, the false teachers claimed the higher knowledge of the divine nature. I am so spiritually high. You guys could never catch up. They had that kind of attitude. So they tended to marginalize everybody else. Well, you're not like me. Love's presence is a sure indicator of transformation. Salvation is there. The person who hates his brother is walking in darkness. Well, he's one of the finest Christians I know. Well, he can't get along with anybody, but he's one of the finest Christians I know. Is he? person who hates his brother walks in darkness, while the one who loves his brother walks in light, the light that's coming. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. John takes another side trip, another topic. He talks about spiritual growth, verses 12 to 14. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Later on, I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. He then talks about young men, but I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Verse 14, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Stage three is spiritual fathers. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Verse 14, I've written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning, a repeat. Three stages of spiritual growth. The young, newly saved, possibly open to deception. The young men and women who are loving the word of God and defeating the enemy as they go. And lastly, the spiritual fathers. Those are ones who seem to be having a love affair with their Lord. What did Paul write in Philippians 3.10? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. There was a man who was in love with his Savior. Spiritual growth depends upon God's power. But it also calls for our responsibility and effort. Say what? It calls for our responsibility and effort. Well, I thought I'm on automatic pilot. I accepted the Lord. I'm now being sanctified. I don't have to do a thing. It's going to happen. No, it won't. Philippians 2.12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Jesus, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow. Ephesians 5.1, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. We have a responsibility and a concern. This is not for weaklings. This is for Christians who use God's help, but make a commitment to serve him. At Word of Life many years ago as a teenager, 
they had a bonfire and they were asking people who would want to dedicate their life to Christ. And you would throw a stick into the bonfire. It was making a commitment. Could you do it? No. The Lord can help you do it. Without him, you can do nothing. But you need to make the decision to do it. All right, quickly go on. Let me just mention the last section, the love God hates, 15 to 17. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? Because you are in Christ. No servant can serve two masters. You belong to Christ, not to the world. Don't love the world. And it's the world system, not the trees and the mountains and everything else. It's the world system. Uh, what the world does. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Sin affects every aspect of a person's being. Don't join in. That's another reason not to love the world. The Lord hates sin. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, we read in Proverbs. And men and women are under the domination of Satan in whom you once walked, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Don't love the world system. It's ruining people. And because the world, the world is going and the world is passing away, verse 17, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Do you know, Christian, you're abiding forever? Takeaways. For those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, let me just preface the comment by the fact that I'm going to ask you questions, and that should be familiar during this time of COVID. You go to a doctor's office, they say, now, have you been out of state? Have you been in contact with anyone? Have you done this? Have you done that? And so forth. So I have questions for you, just four. Number one, are you ignoring the sins in your life or regularly confessing each one by name? Are you ignoring the sins in your life or regularly confessing each one by name? Oh, Lord, forgive me because I know I did some sins today. No, no, no. It's embarrassing to mention all the things that I did. Embarrass yourself. Tell the Lord specifically, because confession is agreeing with God that it was wrong. Second question. Are you choosing not to accept sin's offers when tempted to do so? Are you choosing not to accept sin's offers when tempted to do so? That's deciding not to do it. Well, I can't help it. You can. You've been freed. You're slaves to God now, not slaves to the world. Number three, are you careful to keep God's commandments in scripture? Well, I guess I take a shot at it once in a while. If someone mentions it at the chapel, I think about it. Are you reading God's word and looking for ways to obey? And lastly, are you loving other Christians, even the difficult ones? People in your own family, perhaps. Are you ignoring the sins in your life or regularly confessing each one by name? Are you choosing not to accept sin's offers when tempted to do so? Are you careful to keep God's commandments in scripture? Are you loving other Christians, even the difficult ones? And lastly, for those who are not yet believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. COVID, if COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us that life can be taken from us at any time. Listen to the Apostle John in this paraphrase of the first four verses of the book. He writes, Christ was alive when the world began. Yet I myself have seen him with my own eyes and listened to him speak. I have touched him with my own hands. He is God's message of life. 
This one who is life from God has been shown to us, and we guarantee that we have seen him. I am speaking of Christ, who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then was shown to us. Again, I say we are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may share the fellowship and the joys we have with the Father and with Jesus Christ, his Son. And if you do, as I say in this letter, then you too will be full of love, full of joy, and so will we. John is telling you what he and the disciples saw. We love to see an interview on TV with an eyewitness of what happened. John and the disciples were eyewitnesses. And they're telling you it's true. And that there's a need for accepting Christ as Savior. If you've never done that, this is the time to do that. COVID, yeah, be afraid. Sin, death, hell, and judgment, be very afraid. Let's close our time in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what John has written in this letter. An incredible letter, Father. We've just scratched the surface. Father, we ask that you would bring these thoughts back to our minds. And may we flip through and read the first two chapters and think about what's being said and how it affects our life. Help us, Father, to confess our sin regularly, specifically to turn down sin's offers, to obey your commandments, the yeses and the noes, and to love fellow Christians and others, even the difficult ones. And if any here do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, Father, may they choose to accept Christ. It's an escape, escape to light, to a future, to forgiveness. Oh, Father, may it be so for your name's sake. Dismiss us with your blessing and continue to bless this assembly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.